Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Fraternity Foodie. My name is Mike with Greek University. As you know, we call these interviews Fraternity Foodie because there is nothing like food that brings people together. So we're going to tackle some of the really tough conversations going on in fraternity and sorority today. We're also going to get the inside scoop on what our guests like to eat and where we can go to get it. So stay tuned towards the end of the interview. We are going to talk about food, my favorite topic. So we have talked already to higher ed administrators. We've spoken to speakers in this industry. We've spoken to board members of fraternities, even undergraduates today within our chapters. But now I think we need to speak with involved alumni. I think that's really important to get the alumni perspective. So I have a wonderful treat for everybody today. My good friend and Sigma Pi alumnus, Ron Brown is here today. Welcome, Ron. I, I had to do that because you were uh, teasing me earlier in the day that my microphone wasn't working, being that it's April Fool's Day. So I thought, well, I'll just start off with just moving my lips and not talking. I am doing well. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I, you, this is this is foodie. Where's that pizza you said you were going to have delivered here? <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. It wasn't in the budget. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, this is great. All right. Well, I, now that we have the April Fool's joke out of the way, now let's get to the real yeah. interview. So you have stayed involved with the Central Michigan chapter of Sigma Pi. You've done their chapter director in the past. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about that position as chapter director. I know you've passed the torch now, um, but talk to me a little bit about what's difficult about being a chapter director and what is rewarding about that position. Uh, the rewarding part is is just the relationships that you build. You know, you, you see him come up as 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 a new guy. Uh, you know, you get to know them. You get to know where they're from. You get to know what makes them tick, and then they graduate, and uh, a number of them stay in touch. You know, uh, it, you you stay in touch on Facebook, or you know, you drop them a line every once in a while when something big happens in their life. So. Uh, it's, it's, it's just great to hang out with the guys. The tough parts, um, having the tough conversations, um, uh, leading the uh, executive boards uh, to, to you know, be able to make those as well. I know we had a, um, uh, an e-board that uh, we had to get rid of uh, like three guys on the e-board because of, of something really, really um, uh, inappropriate that they did and um, it, it was it was tough for the guys uh, it wasn't tough for for us because we knew that it, it was either those guys or the, or the group was going to suffer so um, you know sometimes you you do the right thing so that the people um, uh, learn that lesson at, in school and not out in the real world after they get their first job. So. Yeah. Was there anything challenging about working with the alumni and kind of being that bridge between the undergraduates and the alumni? Yeah. I mean, there always is. You always have a small percentage of the guys uh, who think that uh, they're going to come back and, and relive their undergraduate days. Um, like old school, the movie, and they don't realize that, yeah, I mean, even if you tell them over and over and over again, that the climate has changed and the stuff that we did when we were, you know, actives in the group um, will get you thrown in jail now. So um, it, it's, it's, it's a different world and it really is. it's hard for them to get up to speed on it. So, yeah. Now, I'm assuming that the chapter today has some sort of alumni newsletter. What types of things are you talking about in that newsletter? What have you seen? How is that newsletter distributed to all the alumni? Um, my what newsletter is so, so 1970s. So, uh, you know, we do send out an occasional card um, with uh, like an event calendar on it. But most of the information that is transferred uh, between the alumni 
uh, chapter and the undergrad chapter is done on their Facebook pages now. Gotcha. So, what about alumni that aren't on Facebook? Do they just miss out? How do they get the information? Um, yeah, some of them do miss events, uh, but we do a pretty good job of, um, of uh, what would it be, like group leaders, you know, where somebody uh, in their pledge class, you know, still is remains in touch with like five or six of the guys, you know, who are uh, their close friends. And they do a pretty fair job of keeping, you know, the ones who are not um, as social media savvy up to speed and, and let them know, hey, you know, uh, we're going to a baseball game or we're going to be hanging out over here. So I like that idea of group leaders. I think that's smart, just assigning people to certain, could be pledge classes, could be decades, whatever. I like that idea. I think that's really smart. Um, are you seeing any type of mentoring happening between the alumni and the undergraduates? I'm thinking about job opportunities, maybe looking over resumes or interviewing skills. Are you seeing any of that transfer between the alumni and the, yeah. un the undergrads? Yeah, some of that. Um, we're seeing a lot of alumni uh, alumni um, putting uh, undergrad brothers in positions um, prior to those positions being listed. Um, one of the things I always wanted to do was put together a um, uh, like a job fair, you know, annually or you know every semester, and uh, I was never able to get that off the ground. I thought that that would be a really really good uh, a thing to have so you know maybe that's something that uh, that the next guy can uh, can put together yeah I could definitely put you in touch with the Cornell alumni at Cornell Sigma Pi that's something that they do every year in New York City and I okay. know it is very very successful and it's also a reason why people join the Sigma Pi chapter is they're aware that that kind of an event is happening every single year and that turns into real jobs so um, mm -hmm. I think if we can get that off the ground, it's huge. So I can certainly connect the two of you uh, to see if we can, you know, learn from them what has worked, what hasn't worked, and how uh, they've been able to keep that event going for probably a decade already, at least, if not more. Um, so that's really great. Now, I know that Kurt Carson had a lot to do with the house that's at Central Michigan Sigma Pi. And one of the most frequently asked questions that I get from active brothers of fraternities all over the country, all different fraternities, they always ask me the same question, which is, why don't the alumni buy us a house? That's the question that I get. And I know there was a core group of alumni at Central Michigan Sigma Pi that helped to get it off the ground. Kurt being in the industry certainly helped quite a bit. Your house is absolutely beautiful at Central Michigan. If you haven't seen the house, go check that out to any of our listeners. So how did that house come about? Because there are many chapters around the country that would give their left leg for that house. So how did that happen? Well, that, that is the, the fourth house that we've owned in Mount Pleasant. Uh, the first one was a couple of blocks north. Uh, that burned down just before I joined the group. Um, when, we, when I joined the group, we didn't have a house. Um, and there was some concern over whether or not the group would go on, you know, could go on without a house. And uh, it, the, I'll have to tell you the story sometime about a midnight ride over 30 miles on a bicycle uh, of one guy who uh, started a fire, you know, and the guys who were still around, you know, and said, hey, you know, it, it's not about a house, it's about us, and we're going to keep this thing going forward. Um, when I joined the group, um, Kirk Carson and I uh, put together a um, package and bought a house down near the downtown area which is several blocks from campus. And then we came uh, back and bought the property uh, when we got over 100 people after I graduated and um, uh, sold the, the smaller house, which was down near uh, downtown to pay for some improvements. And we've owned that property since then. Well, when the group got kicked off from campus, um, the house, was considered by the university to be a magnet for some activity that shouldn't that they didn't never want to see go on again. So one of the things we had to agree to was not coming back in that on the in that um, uh, venue. Uh, you know, it was a 112, 113 year old house, uh, and it 
uh, didn't have a square wall or floor in the entire thing. Uh, and uh, the, w the cost of keeping it up was just uh, unbelievable. So when we, dis when we uh, got the agreement to bring the group back, um, we did a tremendous amount of fundraising and uh, got the mortgage from the bank. Um, and that was uh, uh, definitely a Kirk Carson uh, spearhead. Um, although we had a lot of other alumni, um, you know, the alumni uh, association president and the housing corps um, was reinvigorated. And so, uh, you know, there were folks, you know, in that area. Uh, but Kurt got the, um, uh, the same group that was building the houses all along Main Street there uh, to build our house. And I think we had it done in, in three or four months. Incredible. Because we needed to knock it down when the students moved out in the uh, in the spring, and we needed to have it ready to go by the time fall rolled around in August. So uh, it was all hands on deck. That's just incredible. Uh, you know what Kurt did there is just tremendous. Um, so, uh, you know, I hope that the undergrads appreciate what Kurt did there, uh, your work, of course, over the years, but that's just incredible, uh, to be able to get a house up like that in a period of four months is just incredible. Absolutely incredible. Um, now there are many chapters, you mentioned that, you know, the chapter went away for a little while. There are many chapters of Sigma Pi today that are dormant, and the Delta Alpha chapter was also obviously dormant for a while as well. So how do you maintain those bonds of brotherhood when the chapter itself was not in existence? Because there are many alumni that are listening here to us today that might find themselves in that situation. Sure. Um, we never stopped being a brotherhood. Um, the the group the alumni group has always maintained different events and things that we uh, uh, attend uh, and keep up with each other you know that way um, you have to cultivate different age groups you know so every four year period or five year period you have to have somebody who knows the people in that period so that they can be the conduit to reach out and say, hey, um, uh, you know, the, the, the house is in trouble. We, we need to, to pay off the back taxes and we need to, you know, knock it down and build a new one. And, and here's you know, how to get involved and here's where you need to be. And, you know, uh, here's how much we need you to write a check for. And, you know, come on, let, let's go. Let's uh, meet over at, a, you know, O'Kelly's and have a beer and, and, and you know, relive our days, but we really need help here. So um, it, it, it can't be just one person, uh, you know, to be one person to, to have the idea and to light the fire, but it can't be just one person, you know, doing all the heavy lifting. Um, you know, we have a, uh, a thing in our group where you can either be a jawbone or a backbone. And the jawbone talks about doing the work, but the backbone is the actual one who does the work. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if 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 you're can if you're called a jawbone, that's not a good thing. <laughs> I love it. That's true. So now that, the, <laughs> so now that the chapter is back, and I think better than ever. What types of events are you holding in Central Michigan, in Mount Pleasant, that brings all the alumni back? What are you seeing that brings the, the alumni? Uh, well, homecoming has always been huge. Um, you know, it has been since the 60s when the group was started. Yeah. Uh, the, the university always has a parade, you know, before the homecoming game and the marching band and the fire trucks and the local people who are running for political office are all marching in the parade and um, it, it always goes past the house so we're always there at 10 o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning you know rain or shine or snow you know for that and then there's a cookout and then you know people are going to the game you know go down to the game and those who don't hang around and, and uh, you know listen to the music and, and, and drink a beer and, and you know network so uh, that's that's the biggest one of the year. Other things that we do, uh, we have uh, a golf outing every year. Um, 
in Mount Pleasant at the Polecat or you know one of the other uh, really nice courses. Um, we always meet in the summer for a Tiger baseball game down in Detroit. Uh, that's usually very well attended by you know 50, 60 guys every year. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there's a Christmas party hosted in Lansing in the middle of the state by Al Kent, who's one of my pledge brothers. And that uh, uh, happens between Christmas and New Year's every year. And, uh, you know, we'll normally have, you know, 80 or 90 guys at that. So uh, if I remember correctly from the last one, but, you know, as well as, you know, smaller events, uh, there's a group over on the West side that get together, you know, every couple of years or so at a, a local watering hole over there. And, uh, you know, different people who are, you know, doing stuff like going skiing together and things like that, you know, where there'd be five or six guys. So, uh, th- there's always something going on in the alumni group. Yeah. So that's wonderful. And you have different types of events. I think that's bringing out different types of alumni. Certainly the parade is the big one. So everybody seems to come back for the parade. I've actually seen that in person and that was tremendous. Um, I love seeing that event. Incredible. Uh, how many people were out in front of the house? Oh my God. I mean, there was literally, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of people out in front of the house. Um, so you just can't miss that event. I mean, it's huge. Um, so that was a lot of fun to see. I haven't seen a lot of parades like that, especially just right in front of the fraternity house. So it makes it nice and convenient for everybody to meet there and watch the festivities. So that's pretty neat. I love it. All right. So fraternity today, you know, it's very different, I think, than when we pledged Sigma Pi way back when, uh, when the dinosaurs roamed the earth, of course. Um, Liability today is a big deal, and the stakes seem even higher today. So from your perspective, is there anything that should change about fraternity in order to ensure that we're thriving on campuses and that we continue to grow as fraternity? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, the, the, the thing that I think sets our group apart (coughs) from other groups that have either gone off campus and not come back or, um, are, are struggling is that, uh, alumni, um, involvement, you know, having somebody and, and, and not somebody who graduated four or five years ago. You know, somebody that graduated 10 or 20 years ago. Um, and and if, if you're talking about a group that is younger, uh, that is struggling like that, find somebody from another Sigma Pi chapter um, who can come in and help you navigate that. Because there is nothing, I, I, I always say, there's nothing like good adult supervision. Um, and you, you hate to say that because you know, all of these young men are adults, but, uh, you know, the, the, the area of the brain that switches from the, oh, hell yeah, to, well, hold on, let's think about that for just a minute, doesn't fully develop in males until about 25. So you need somebody who can go, uh, well, hold on, let's think about that for a minute. You know, it might not be a good idea to go out and drink beer on the roof of the house. So um, it, it's it's just uh, that that adult supervision, the the, the alumni involvement, uh, positive alumni involvement, because there can be negative alumni involvement too, as we both know. Sure. Uh, that makes all the difference in the world. You know, between um, you know the group staying on campus and thriving, and the group getting kicked off from campus. So. Yeah, I agree 100%. Interestingly enough, past Grand Sage, Andrew Morris had the same exact answer. And I agree with both of you. I think alumni involvement seems to be the common piece that really differentiates between a successful chapter and one that struggles or maybe even loses the charter, God forbid. Um, And so I agree with you. We have to figure out a way to do that. There are plenty, to your point, I think there are plenty of Sigma Pi alumni from other chapters that maybe their own chapter is dormant. So that's a perfect opportunity to get them involved again because they don't have an undergraduate chapter that's still functioning. So that's one opportunity. But even if it's somebody from another fraternity, even if it's 
somebody who was in a sorority. I mean, you know, obviously we can't show them our rituals. So I think there are times when we start the meeting and end the meeting that obviously they can't be there if they're from another organization. But I think we do have to kind of think outside of the box and we have to find people, um, even in cities where maybe we don't have a ton of our alumni, there are plenty of fraternity and sorority alumni that want that experience and want to help. They want to give back. Um, and maybe they don't have a chapter or maybe they're too far away from their own chapter. So that becomes a great opportunity. And I think, you know, we really need to kind of um, just think outside of the box and, and find people uh, to help these chapters. And if we can, then I think that that will certainly help our chapters continue to grow, be relevant and be successful into the next century. But without it, I agree with you. Um, I just, even when I was an undergraduate, I did stupid things because I, I just wasn't mature enough. It wasn't until I was age 25 and then I look back on it and I go, well, that was pretty stupid. Um, so, you know, you live and learn, but uh, hopefully some of the undergraduates that are listening today will, will listen to that and find somebody to help them. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I think yeah, if, it's, if it's somebody who, who is uh, uh, a little older and has the ability to talk to uh, the, the people with the university and with the, the cities that the, the chapters are in, that helps out too. I remember one instance where um, we were talking to the university about, you know, something that uh, one of our guys had done. It wasn't a group. It was you know, one, one guy who'd done something really goofy. And um, the, the person who was in charge of the meeting, you know, said something to me and, and I, I don't even remember what it was now. And I had, you know, brothers on both sides of me, I practically came across the table at him and shut him down. And he kept arguing and I, and I, I just shut him down because what he was saying was wrong and what he was doing was wrong. And once that all settled back down again, there was a whole different level of respect in the room, you know, and, and I wasn't, I just wasn't going to roll over for the university because if, if my group was wrong, I would have said, yeah, okay, that's right. But he was just dead wrong in what he was saying and I wasn't going to let him get away with it. So you, you have to be advocates for your guys too. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, I think, but, but not if, but, but not if you know that they did something stupid. Right. I agree with you. I think if they are affiliated with the university in some way, um, I think that can certainly help the group. Um, they're also aware of different ways that the university could use these men uh, on campus, and they're just aware of different needs that maybe somebody who isn't connected to the university doesn't really know about. So I think that that's certainly helpful, but I agree. They have to be advocates. Um, and also, I think we can't forget about the tool of doing alumni initiations, for example. So perhaps there's somebody that works for the university that is an advocate for these students, but maybe he or she is not a member of a Greek organization. So we can't forget about the fact that we can do alumni initiations, and maybe if it's a male, maybe we decide that we're going to initiate them into Sigma Pi. Um, and then I think they're advocates from the inside, that now they actually understand our ritual, right. they understand our, the traditions, they understand everything about what it means to be a fraternity and what the value is to our community, and now they're fighting from the inside as members. So I think that's another tool that some of the chapters can think about, even when they can't find somebody who happens to be a member of a Greek organization. Right. Very good. So you've been working now for Northwood University for 10 years, uh, over 10 years. So what types of things are you working on as Associate Director of Instructional Technology at Northwood? If I told you that, you know what would have to happen. <laughs> Don't kill me. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my group, Michael, handles all of the technology for both the face-to-face -face and the, the virtual classrooms. So we're always looking at, you know, the latest, greatest, you know, state-of-the-art stuff. And then we figure out, you know, how we can do that on the budget that we have. So, um, you know, we just got done... Um, uh, building a, uh, a new undergraduate building. It was actually the old graduate building. And when they moved into their new building, we gutted it and, and redid it. So there's laser projectors and all kinds of crazy stuff in there. And then um, uh, 
uh, I guess the, the big project, you know, this spring and into the fall is we're building a brand new esports arena. Wow. And I don't know how, how up you are on video game stuff and esports, but it, it, it's going to be bigger than soccer someday. Wow. That and, is huge. And right now, uh, there aren't a lot of universities doing esports teams. And uh, so we decided to get in on the ground floor of that. We've hired a coach and we're building an esports center. So that is just incredible. I mean, talk about things that were never even dreamt of when we were undergraduates. And now this huge market opens up that never existed. That's just incredible. Very, very cool. Yeah. So uh, look forward to uh, uh, seeing students coming out of Northwood University with uh, uh, business degrees and. Uh, you know, being the leaders of esports teams and going on to make millions of dollars out in Las Vegas and all around the world. So that is so cool. So cool. All right. Very good. So Mount Pleasant, of course, is a wonderful college town. You know that we love to eat here at Fraternity Foodie. So if we find ourselves in Mount Pleasant, where should we go to eat and what should we be ordering? Man, that was a tough one. I mean, you know, when I go back to town and I'm there very frequently, yeah. uh, a lot of times I will swing by the Pixie and pick up a Coney dog because that's been there since I was a baby uh, <laughs> and before, since my parent was, parents were babies. Uh, John's Country Burgers is one of the last drive-ins, I think, in the state. So you can pull up in your car and hit the little button and the car hop will bring the food out to you. And that's, that's all handmade. Um, you know, there are a couple of really good restaurants in the casino. Uh, not that I frequented those, but, uh, <laughs> and then there's, a, a, you know, a place uh, near where I grew up, uh, the old train station uh, that's called Mountain Town Station that has some, some good food and some good, uh, uh, you know, craft beer uh, activity there too. But I think, it, if if I get a craving for Mount Pleasant, it's uh, Stan's Wonderland Diner downtown because a couple of times a week they roast turkeys and uh, bake bread and they have a turkey salad sandwich that is just out of this world. I, I you know, that and a bowl of uh, chicken noodle soup in there, turkey noodle soup and that's that's nirvana for me <laughs> that sounds good so next time i'm in mount pleasant we're going to stands for that turkey sandwich i okay. need to try that <laughs> all right very it's cool. outstanding yeah all right sounds good so if our audience wants to connect with you and maybe they have a couple of questions for you where can they go maybe on social media in order to connect with you uh sure i'm on facebook um ron brown with an e cool and, uh, you know, if you want my, my home email, it's uh, Ron Brown, with an E, of course, at charter.net. Very cool. I appreciate that. There could be other chapters around the country that might want to follow up and ask another question and try and figure out how you've been so successful. I think that's so cool. Um, so that's certainly uh, an option for our audience. And I have to tell you, you know, Ron, some of the other alumni, guys like Kirk Carson, you guys were truly instrumental in my opinion, in bringing back the chapter of Sigma Pi at Central Michigan. And I really believe that guys like you and Kurt, you're kind of the glue that holds it all together in so many different ways. Um, I think there's been a ton to celebrate with this particular chapter in recent years. And I think it's because of the involved alumni like you guys um, that is, makes them successful. And so if you are an undergraduate that's watching this, Think about some of the things that we talked about here today and make sure that you go out and find that resource for you that can act just like this um, as an involved alumnus. You can contact your headquarters, the Greek Life Office, or contact me or Ron and, and we'll do what we can to try and help you find somebody. Um, but I think it's so important because this is what separates the chapters from being successful from those who are going to struggle and continue to struggle. So it's critical that you bridge this gap between the chapter and the alumni out there who want to help. So thank you so much for that great advice. And thank you to the audience for joining us. We look forward to seeing you on an upcoming edition of Fraternity Foodie. Bye for now.